If you want to learn how to build a pyramid shaped landing with stairs with no stringers needed, keep on watching. Let's get started. I recently installed this massive backyard patio, but in order to do so, I had to remove the existing stairwell. Now it's time to rebuild, and it's going to be a much bigger, more professional looking stairwell in the end. I first figure out the exact center mark of our doorway, then mark a few lines which indicates where I want the landing to be located. The vast majority of our framing is going to be made up of 2x8 pressure treated lumber. The first board I'm cutting is right at 5 feet because the landing itself is going to be 5 feet wide by 3 feet deep. Once I have our first board cut, I start laying out our joists every 16 inches on center as well as the ends. However, we are going to be going with a picture frame look which will give us a nice professional look and feel, but that also means we need to double up a few of our joists, which means that we have to take some time and energy and a little bit more material to do this, but it will pay off in dividends in the end, I assure you. All this material is an inch and a half wide, so I have to burn three inches to make sure that we have a perfect three foot by five foot landing. That's why these smaller sections are only 33 inches wide, and I do do a bit of layout at this point before I start nailing, but before I even get to that, I need to get to some screwing. Because these are deck to wall spacers that I have to screw in place on the back side of our ledger board. And these black hockey pucks might not look like a lot, but they're extremely valuable because they allow more airflow in between our landing and our house framing. And that is very important because we don't want any moisture to get trapped in between these two boards. And these deck to wall spacers help prevent moisture buildup from happening. We can now finally get to some nailing. And the first thing I'm going to nail is these doubled up joists for our border around our landing. I always find it much easier to lay out these boards on their side and then nail them accordingly prior to moving them into position. As for nails, I'm using galvanized 3 inch ring shank nails which are perfect for this type of application and every connection point as you see here is going to have 3 nails attached to it. I suggest getting your rim joists attached to all your other joists first and then as you go to your ledger board on the back side, I only install the two ends at first because I want to double check my cross dimensional measurement. This is a very simple but important measurement because you need to make sure that that measurement cross dimensionally is the same on both sides. If it's not, then you might have to do a few love taps one direction or the other to guarantee that that measurement is equal on both sides. If it's not, that means you're not square and therefore your box is not going to lay out appropriately once it comes time to installing your decking boards. So my advice, just make sure that box is perfectly square because it might take a little extra time at the front end, but it's going to save you a lot of time in the long run. Our landing framing is done, now let's attach it to our house. In order to do so, I'm using these 6 inch long lag screws by Fasten Master. Their actual name is Ledger Lock because they are specifically designed for ledger boards, for decks or in this case a landing. I pre-drill my holes ahead of time so I know exactly where those deck to wall spacers are located as I'm trying to install. Before I get it attached to the house, I do cut some 4x4 posts because this is what's going to support the front side of our landing. Once I have a couple of these posts cut to approximately the correct height, I then actually clamp them down to the framing. I don't screw them in because I don't know exactly where I'm going to have these placed as of yet, and I want to get the house side fully fastened and leveled out appropriately before I start installing the legs. Once I have one side screwed down, I then release the clamp and actually hammer down my framing into the correct position so I have a perfectly level framework. Once I have that, I can then secure the rest of our ledger locks. As always, I will have a full list of tools materials listed out in the description, so if you are interested in purchasing any of these products or checking them out yourself, please know it's readily available below. Speaking of below, these are going to be placed below our 4x4 posts. They're called tough blocks and they're extremely strong and durable. Each one of these can hold over 1700 pounds and these not only help for structurability purposes, but they're also easily modified which you'll see comes in handy fairly shortly. Once I had level, I then placed a mark on our 4x4, brought it over to our chop saw, cut any excess and used a few lag screws to secure it into our joists. 
two of these is plenty for a landing of this size. However, I did want to make sure I was beefy as possible on this project. So I put in a third tough block and four by four posts just in case. In order to make the stair installation a little bit easier and make sure that everything is fully connected together, I am going to be placing blocking around the entire perimeter of our landing so we have something to secure too. However, this is where the modification of our tough blocks come into play because I have to take my multi-tool and cut any of the excess that sticks out past our blocking. There were a couple different options to get around this scenario, but I found that this was going to be the easiest and the most straightforward. If this was a larger stairwell, I would do more of a stair stringer system, but on this application, because we're only dealing with two steps, I decided I wanted to go with a beefier box frame system, which is going to be more substantial in terms of framing. But with any project, the most important part is to make sure that your stair steps are consistent all the way down, or at least close to. In order to make sure that I had consistent stair risers all the way up, I ran all these pieces through my table saw at six inches, and therefore that step is gonna be six inches plus an inch and a half for the deck board, which means we're gonna have a total of seven and a half inches. This is a good time to ask my audience now, would you like to see detailed shop drawings as well as material lists for this entire project? I do provide that occasionally on framing projects like this, but I wanna know from you, would you be interested? Let me know. The layout of our first box step is very similar to the layout that we did to our landing. However, the two side sections I actually leave blank and don't install those ribs yet because those are going to be diagonal ribs, which I'm going to install eventually. We'll get to those, but I'm wanting to make sure that I have all the boxes fully installed before I get to those. I attach our first box step to our blocking as well as our 4x4 posts and start moving on to the side sections. As I noted earlier, this entire landing is going to have blocking all the way around it, which not only beefs up the entire structure and makes it more rigid, but it also makes the installation of the stairs much easier. As long as you centered the first step appropriately, both sides of these step boxes are going to be the same exact size, which definitely makes the fabrication process even easier. As you can see here, this is a very tight fit, which is why I needed to provide a few love taps just to get it into position. Once positioned correctly, I then nail off the remaining board and check to make sure that the height of this second box is lined up perfectly with the first box that we previously installed. Once I know those seams are flush, I then grab my level just to double check to make sure the entire span is level or at least pointed away from the house. We don't want any slope towards the house at this point. I screw the step into our bracing and then we can move on to our cross dimensional measurement at the front corners of our step. And the nice thing about this is that it's actually quite simple to figure out because it's going to be a 45 degree one direction or the other. We just need to make sure that we have the proper length. To make it easier on me, the first cut I place is just a 45 degree on one side. Then I go back to the same corner, line up the cut that I just made and strike a line at the very bottom of the board on the opposite side then bring it back to our saw, cut that line exactly where my mark is, and if you did things at least close to correctly, it should fit in quite nicely. In order to have a nice beefy corner at this location, I do double up these boards in order to guarantee that we have plenty of surface area to screw in our deck boards once we get to that point. I nail off these cross braces to the adjacent framing right next to it, as well as nail these boards together themselves. Once fully installed, I add additional support because I still want to have a consistent 16 inches on center. This will look good especially for aesthetic reasons once we get our deck boards installed. I do the same exact process to the opposite side, just know that it's completely mirrored except for the fact that I had to work around all these unique items and hopefully on your project you certainly don't have to deal with that. Once we have our ground level box steps fully installed, we can move on to our second row of box steps. And for this row, we don't have to cut down our material at all as far as the actual height goes, because these boards are already seven and a half inches tall, which is exactly what we planned for. If you're wondering, each step is 13 and a half inches deep, and therefore the small braces in between our two long boards are only 10 and a half inches long. I of course double check our cross dimensional measurement to guarantee that the entire box is square. Once I like the look of it, I install all our center support braces and away we go with the sides. The sides are installed just as I did the row below it, it just might have taken a few extra love taps on this particular one. 
Once I have it in position, I then double check my levelness and start securing it to our back bracing. The one tip I have for you at these locations is to wait to install your center support bracing until you have the frame installed because you can then install this bracing perfectly in line with the bracing below it and that means this entire structure is even more supportive but it also means that your screws for your decking boards are going to be lined up appropriately on both levels of your stairwell. The doubled up diagonal bracing is also placed on this stairwell as well because we're still going to do a nice picture frame style of deck boards all the way around eventually. The last and final step of the framing assembly is to screw down our top step to the bottom step. Now this might be overkill but I feel like over time this might move eventually and therefore to make sure that it doesn't happen I make sure to drill in 3 inch long screws. The hard part is over the framing. Now we can get to decking and for decking there are numerous options but on this project we're going to go with cedar 2x6s. Now that's because the opposite side of the house does already have this type of material built into it so we wanted to keep the pattern. We're going to cut these down appropriately, get them installed and we'll be done. That might be a little easier said than done but this process really isn't that difficult to do. The first step of cutting these deck boards is to make sure we have a perfect 45 degree angle. Once we have our first 45 degree angle, I then flip the board over and measure lengthwise at the very tip of our board at 62 inches. Now I'm cutting at 62 inches because I want a one inch overhang on both sides of our deck. You'll see why we're doing this in the very near future, but just know that the one inch overhang is quite important. That is a one inch overhang on all sides, so that means the sides as well as the front of our landing. And in order to keep that one inch consistent all the way across, I do use a clamp and clamp the board down prior to installing any of our screws because I don't want this board to move on us at all during the screwing process. Once the front picture frame board is installed, it's time for the sides. When it's possible, I always find it's easier to cut our 45 degree angle first perfectly and then work off the very tip of that cut. Then our second cut is just a 90 degree straight cut, which is obviously just a much easier pinpoint measurement to cut. These are cedar deck boards and they will expand and contract, so I do suggest placing some type of spacer in between these two mitered boards. This is an eighth inch deck wise deck spacer, which I find is a perfect thin spacer at these locations. Once I have one corner of this border installed, I then start moving on to installing the rest of our deck boards before I make my way to installing the other perimeter board. The spacers at these locations are larger and I'm using a 5 16 inch deck spacer from DeckWise as well. As far as fasteners go, because we're working with cedar, you do want to use a stainless steel screw because if you don't, the screws may discolor your cedar over time. And since these screws are going to be visible, I do also suggest having a speed square on hand to guarantee that you have proper alignment with the row right next to it, as well as having spaced out accordingly one inch in on each cedar board on each side, if that makes sense. The last board does have to be ripped down to the appropriate size, so I do run it through my table saw to have a perfectly spaced deck board that runs right up to our house. But in order to figure out the length of this board because I'm not going to be able to cut it when it's underneath the house, I grab a carpenter square and guarantee that we have a proper square edge at this location. Then I'm able to measure that measurement and cut it to the appropriate size. This piece fits snugly into place and I'm able to maneuver the board alongside it with all the shims perfectly spaced out. Once we screw them down, we can move on to our final border board. You might have noticed already that all these boards are cut long because I'm able to take a circular saw and just do a nice rip cut all the way across the line that we previously laid out. I do suggest having some type of straight edge like a level to butt up against your circular saw so you have something to guide the saw versus just your hand all the way across these boards. However, your circular saw can only go so far, so I'm using a multi-tool to cut any of the remainder of the pieces that I previously cut, but I did take off one board that was just too difficult to cut with my multi-tool or circular saw due to the large log cabin that we're going up against. Our final border board for our landing is installed just as we did the opposite side. Just double check your spacing on both the top and the bottom of the board. 
As I make my way to the next step down, this perimeter board is installed just as we installed the border on the landing. However, the one thing that is slightly different is the next row of boards that needs to be installed because these are also mitered corner edges. I find that taking that measurement and just burning three quarters of an inch gives me the perfect dimension needed to fit in our sideboards with our 5 16 inch spacers, but also have enough room for our 1 8 inch spacers in between our miters. Once I have these boards fully installed, the next row is done similarly, except for the fact that I need to account for the thickness of this space and rip cut it on my table saw. Lining up all these mitered corners was time consuming, but it was actually quite straightforward and easy because we did our due diligence with squaring up all of our framing first. If this framing wasn't square, it would have made it much more difficult to be accurate with all these cuts. So keep that in mind. And there's a reason why we did so much work and energy to our framework before we even got to our decking. But now that we have our framing taken care of, we can move on to our risers. Now we're going to be placing three quarter inch fascia boards that are also cedar on all of our risers just to have a perfectly finished look in the end. I run these boards through our table saw to have the appropriate thickness and then move it over to our miter saw. You certainly don't have to miter these edges, but I found that it was the final and last professional step that I could make on this entire project to really tie it in together. Once you have one edge mitered at 46 degrees, I then bring my tape measure over to that very edge and mark it accordingly on the inside corner. That way I know where I need to be and it will perfectly align nicely with the edges of our framing that we're trying to conceal. Once I have at least two boards cut, I then bring them over and lay them out accordingly on the risers that we're trying to cover up. As long as I like the layout of them, I then start applying our exterior construction adhesive on the back side. I fold them vertically and press that construction adhesive into our structural framing and then pin nail them down. As far as pin nailing is concerned, it's just there to provide at least a little bit of strength in these positions while the construction adhesive is adhering properly, while also reducing the size of the nail holes that you'll see in the very end. I make quick work of the installation process of all of our toe kicks, and once that's taken care of, we can move on to the final step, securing the remainder of our screws into our deck boards. A large speed square is very handy to have on hand when trying to align all these screws correctly because I don't normally have screws that you visually see. With this deck, I did have to use them because the stainless steel screws that were available were these ones. But I certainly don't mind them because I feel that the stainless steel actually complements the cedar. As we wrap up, one final note is that this area is going to be fully covered eventually overhead, so I'm not going to have to worry about much moisture, and that's why I'm not putting any type of joist tape or anything else on our framing before I get to this point. If your exterior landing steps aren't covered up, then I would highly suggest doing some type of deck joist tape, because that's just going to provide you an extra layer of protection over time. But with that said, we are done! I really love how this entire pyramid shaped landing steps turned out, especially with the nice beautiful complement to the patio. And very functional along with something that I know will last for years and years to come. And that's what I call one beautiful sexy beast. Oh yeah. <laughs>